So now here we are in the fifth week of the Google, uh, the Google Hangout, the Google Coden. It's about 75% done, and we've done a good amount of work this week on in, on updating the shaders and just making everything a bit more, just uh, working on what we've done to the rest of the, pro the program. So the first thing I want to talk about is our the uh, transition away from the graphics engine ODE that we used to be using on to uh, our own self-run shader physics. So, um, Sam, we did a lot of work on that. Uh, why don't you tell us what that's going to do to the project? Uh, I think Art can explain more, but currently what we have is a basic uh, distance collision using bounding spheres. So, um, currently that data is being stored to, I think, a texture every frame, and you can read, uh, you can read it and do some more calculations based on that. Or, hmm. Okay, so it's or, just a rudimentary. I'm not good at explaining stuff. Yeah. Okay. It, it's just a rudimentary change right now. We're we're not rid of ODE yet, and I think that's the end goal: is to get rid of this very clunky old system of ODE that's not really suitable for games because it's very, very intense in its physics calculations. Well, ODE also won't run in a browser. That's really the big, uh, big push behind this. Uh, ODE is not a game-specific physics engine either. It's, it, I don't, I don't know if they ever, ever really had a goal beyond just making a physics engine. Um, it's being used for engineering jobs as much as being used for anything else. Um, it's highly accurate, which you don't necessarily want for games. You want speed over accuracy. Um, it renders, it resolves physics in a subframe step. Uh, so uh, you may have physics being calculated a hundred or a thousand times per render frame, which is just wasted CPU. Yeah, we don't um, need that kind of accuracy. Yeah, no one really needs that for a game. And if it if it kind of feels like the physics are working right, that's enough. Um, the first thing we're doing is obsoleting the collision. OD thankfully separates the physics resol resolution, you know, joints and so and and uh, and um, velocity and rotation and such from the collision. So you can use any collision um, detection method you want with ODE. Um, what Samuel did was the first step is just resolving whether or not two things can collide. The problem with, with uh, collision is it's a one-to-many process. Every time you add a new object to a scene, you're doubling the number of computations you, uh, uh, checks you have to make. So if you have four objects, you have to test each of those four objects against each of the other objects in the same scene to see if they uh, have collided. There's other things you can do to pare that down. Um, binary space partitioning and so on, but that's the first thing is see if two things can collide, uh, which we're doing by simple distance and radius. Um, okay. So. And the way we've done that is you talked about we're doing it in the actual uh, shaders, so instead of just having it run on its own thread, it's being run on the GPU. Well, and that's, that's, that's the great thing about the, the GPUs is highly, uh, highly paralyzed. Mm -hmm. so, so for situations like this where we might have 100 objects in a scene, if the GPU can check, it can, the GPU is very good at multi-threading. So we could have one GPU thread check one object, it's only have 100. And we could have 100 threads like that running. And then the time it took to do one of them, we could have all 100 of them. And the same shader that he wrote to test uh, for uh, bounding sphere collisions could run on the side, side of a web browser with WebGL just as easily and won't notice any difference from being used in JavaScript versus C. And that's one of the good things about the new things that are coming to the web. I mean, I read an article earlier today about how WebGL is only one and a half times slower than native processing with ASM.js. And that's just amazing, especially for games. Now, if, if we can implement that in a way that doesn't use specific to desktop software like ODE, then we can definitely take advantage of that. Okay, um, 
So that's just a lot of work that's being added on to what we already do to shaders. And it's just a new step to kind of speeding up and getting rid of the old clunk of what Pythor used to be. Um, so right now, uh, we Samuel uploaded a, a eye candy video to the channel. Uh, let me load that up. And I'll show it to you guys. Okay, that was weird. I accidentally hit the sign out button instead of the switch account button on the Google. Can't you just uh, open a YouTube video? On yeah, I, w I was going to do that, and I was opening up the my videos page on YouTube, and I hit the wrong button. So, I'm just trying to find the video. Should be around here. I don't know why it's so hard to find. I have no clue what it is. I just saw it earlier. Here we go. Here it is. Yeah, it there you go. Okay. And here it is. So, uh, that was a demonstration of the multi-lighting system that, that Samuel set up. So, why don't you talk us through what was going on in that video? <clears throat> um, so, there are three lights, red, green, and blue, in that scene, and they're just moving around and reflecting off a black planar surface, along with the white box. Uh, so, the way that, um, this is set up is... Uh, Materials were changed to become multi-pass with uh, each pass rendering eight lights at a time. So this uh, this can support uh, as many lights as you want. However, there are like um, performance issues, and I'm looking into that right now. So basically, we used to only have one light available at a time, and now you can have as many as you want. Uh, uh, the old OpenGL. Uh, had a maximum of eight lights, but yeah. Okay. And when do you think that will be useful, having more than eight lights? Uh, I guess on well, I guess it's just useful in general when you have more than eight lights in a scene. Maybe okay. I don't know. There's a lot of games that use multiple lights. Yeah. I know there's shaders out there. Um, actually, some of the demonstrations of the awesomeness of, uh, of using shaders is you can... There's shaders written as demonstrations that use, like, 256 lights. Um, that might be overkill, though. Yeah, I think um, 256 is a pretty big number. You're never going to have that many lights in a reasonable scene. Yeah, well, uh, scenes... I mean, in the future, scenes could be arbitrarily large, and we may want multiple lights per area. Um, I think, though, even the four closest lights to an object would be good enough. Yeah, especially because most of the lights are just kind of eye candy. Like, you're going to have two or three ambient lights, and then maybe one or two that are just illuminating everything around it. Samuel, didn't, didn't you use a, didn't you do an API change so the ambient light is now... Uh, <clears throat> oh, yeah. Um, ambient is supposed to represent a global illumination, so that's better placed in the scene. So uh, now lights don't actually cast an ambient color. Uh, the ambient color is just taken from the scene. So they used every single light used to do an ambient light, but now 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah, like, that seems it was like that change. in the old OpenGL, but it didn't really make much sense now, so... Yeah, yeah it seems like a good change to kind of separate your lights. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to talk about is uh, the work that Daryl's been doing on the uh, on the module system and opening up the PySoy to different platforms. He's not here this week, but I'm sure Art can talk about that. Yeah. So, um, QT Soy, which I guess we've been back and forth whether it be QT Soy or KSoy, uh, the client for KDE that uses the QT library, um, is was originally just to prove a concept that you could write a client in pretty much any toolkit you wanted. You're not limited to just no. But um, what he did for the very first time, he has a client running actual Python code. So it starts a background thread. It's doing its own rendering, um, or will do its own rendering. But it launches a background thread embedding Python in the client. Um, and I can screencast uh, what that looks like. Careful. Here we go. Are you, is the screencast working? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So this is the empty QC soy window. Now it's not finished because the rendering should be happening here. It still needs the client plugin uh, running inside of QT soy, which is not yet. Uh, but you have the menu, open Python file. Um, So this is, because q 2 does not provide the client plugin yet, this opens a standard X11 uh, plugin that, as if PySoy had been just run on its own. Um, however, this is part of the same process. This is not as launching it as a separate, uh, launching Python as a separate process. It's all in the one process, so it can run, um, it can run uh, without it. Okay, so I'm assuming what he did there was just have uh, does Qt does the Qt library have some way of running Python code? Uh, I don't believe so. I think he just uh, it does have threading though. Oh, okay. Um, and Python has very Python's designed to be easily embeddable. Uh, for example, uh, GIMP and Blender both embed Python. Mm -hmm. So um, this is, to my knowledge, the first time we've had PySoy running embedded. There's a lot of other GCI tasks and a lot of other things that can be done outside of GCI for embedding PySoy inside of Blender, for example, so you can edit models as you're seeing what they're actually going to look like inside of PySoy. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a cool thing that, that we could work on, but uh, a, a lot of that is really just kind of interfacing with the actual Blender and other uh, interfaces. I mean, it's sometimes hard to work with them because they have obtuse APIs. I'm not sure about the Blender API, but I know that a lot of things which provide Python interactivity, it's, it's not really the most intuitive thing. Yeah. Well, we've, we've had Blender uh, importers, exporters uh, a few times now. Um, it's really not that hard. Um, you can write it in either C or Python. Um, it, I believe the way we wanted to do this was C because of the speed. Uh, you want something that was alive. Uh, the import exporter is Python based, um, but if you had to live edit, you wanted that to be C, so you can be working the same data space. Yeah, just because PyChoice is actually written C binding, so if we could have it in C, it could just be a quick interface. Yep. Um, so going on from what we talked about last week, I think the next thing we should talk about is. The work I've actually been doing on creating a, a VAPI for SRTP. Um, a VAPI, it's it's a kind of a weird thing. It's it's a way for Vela, the Vela compiler, to translate between Vela and C, which is what it's doing for its special libraries. And in the case of what I'm working on, it's it's 
for libsrtp, which is a very obtuse library. Um, so the Vappy isn't very easy to write. But I'm pretty much done with it. And now that it's written, we can start using the SRTP in like Melody and other networking libraries using Babel. Jim, can you screen, cast, screen share an uh, example of the VAP you've been working on? I'm, I'm, I'm on Windows right now because I can't get the plugin to work with my, my Linux Firefox. Okay. But I should have thought up about that beforehand. Well, um, let's see. Did you uh, commit it yet? No, not yet. Okay, mm -hmm. I can open a different VAPI. Yeah. And share that. Okay. Um, let's see, So while he's opening up that, the the main yep. challenge with Vapi is is actually interfacing with the C in the way that Vela works. Because Vela uses a different system of man memory management. It's much more managed than C by default is. So if you look inside this file, um, a lot of a lot of the things in here are just actually translating between C's memory, like default memory management of using pointers and mem and uh, malloc and free, and going into the, man the memory managed uh, way that Vela uses it. Because Vela uses, even though Vela compiles to C, Vela uses glib, which uses a reference counting uh, garbage collector built on top of C. So I have uh, a VAPI for a similar library here. Uh, this is for libmice. Um, ICE is the system you use in Jingle and WebRDC to um, make connections happen, happen through NAT proxies. So um, it looks like Vala. Um, you have a pr uh, prefix. And the prefix is what this, all the things in C inside that namespace start with. Um, and, you know, as you go through, oh, this is the object base. That makes it easier. Mm -hmm. um, for a lot of things, here, let me open uh, something that's not the object based. Here we go. Oh, is so, a good example? Oh, that works. EGL. Yeah. So, um, it's essentially almost line for line what's in the header. Um, but uh, it handles how the how the code gets generated. Mm -hmm. um, come on, there's got to be something in here that's actually object based. That is what based? Object ish. Oh. Here, here we go. Here we go. Yeah. So here, so, in, um, in ODE. Uh, our vector um, is not an, a G object. That's why the compact is listed here. Uh, compact says it's not a G object. Uh, this is a standard C. No, it well. doesn't. Compact just means that it's um, not memory managed. It's not able to be inherited, and it's not under the. It's not yes. translated into the G object system. But you can still yes. have a C object that's that is translating the G object system. Well, it's not a G object. Yeah. Yeah. Not, this is it, wasn't, it wasn't written like that, but the compact just tells Vela not to turn it into that. Like vector exactly. four is. Yeah. So we go down. Um, I think there's a in here. There's a here we go. World. Uh, so um, in ODE, while this is not a G object, it does have a function to create and destroy a world. So uh, it's not rough counted, but uh, this gives Vala enough information, Vala C enough information to uh, create a world object, destroy a world object, and um, handle all of the methods correctly. Mm -hmm. 
and ditto for body. Uh, D body creates used to create it, D body destroy. So we don't actually have to use those commands in our code that uses them. Uh, we just create an object as we would a G object, and then when we no longer use it, it's destroyed. Mm -hmm. And the really cool thing about this is that this, because Vela translates Vela into C and it doesn't translate directly into assembly, instead of, it, you don't need to expose everything. Like, for example, in the SRTP library, uh, I had a problem earlier this week about how some of the data structures were stored as linked lists, but Vela doesn't let you have self-referential objects. So the cool thing about that is that even though the C object does have a part of it that references itself, you don't need to include that, and Vela doesn't care. It doesn't know what's happening in C. It just knows, here's what you told me to translate this into, and then it does that. A lot of uh, custom types in ODE um, and other libraries that we that we use uh, call things that aren't structs structs just because we want uh, Vala to treat it like a struct. Mm -hmm. Vala doesn't care; it just uses the use the to the the label and generates C. And everything is done correctly from there. <laughs> and that's one of the cool things about Vala. I mean, it's it's much easier than writing C and it's much safer because it's all memory managed, and it still has the speed aspect of it. Vela is just as fast as C because it compiles down to C. Um, and then while I was actually talking to one of the, the maintainers of, of the Vela compiler, he explained it to me very simply. Very simply. The way Vela works is that it takes all, all the code you write, and then it translates it to C no matter how inefficient your code is. It doesn't do any optimization, optimization by itself. And then it lets GCC, the C, or whatever C compiler you're using, do all the optimizations it's been having for 30 years. And because of that, you have a system where in the end you're going to have a very optimized file from your maybe, un maybe unoptimized code. Yeah, if you look at some of the generate C, some of it looks kind of ridiculous. It creates all these weird temporary uh, 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 variables that it only uses once and then forgets about. But when you actually look at GCC, you can put, you can make your own sample code that that uses one variable and then another one that uses temporary var uh, variables. The binary outputs could be exactly the same. Mm -hmm. GCC just ignores all that and treats it as if it was the same. Um, those are just for safety because it needs to make sure the code it generates compiles the way you expect it to. It also allows people to, even though it looks funny at first glance, when you actually look through it, it lets the it makes it seem easier for the compiler to do. One of the really cool things about GCC is that over the 30 years it's been around, it's had thousands and thousands of incredibly smart people going and saying, okay, you declare a variable here, and then you stop using it for the rest of the program. So let's stop referencing it and free it. But most compilers can't make that assumption because it's incredibly hard for you to do look-aheads, is what they're called, in the source, and then figure out what's needed and what's not needed. So the Vela compiler doesn't do that. It just relies on the, the expertise and the millions of man hours has gone into GCC to do its optimization. And uh, I actually, the cool thing about that is that I'm actually about to commit a patch to the Vela compiler, so in just as working on the VAPI is uh, give me more and more open source to work on. What sort of patch for? Um, one of the, the, the VAPI for POSIX, the POSIX implementation, it wasn't the way a struct there was implemented. It it was trying to compile it as a uh, with a copy function instead of just doing a plain copy. So I just changed it so that this, the Bailey compiler knew there was no copy function. Cool. Yep. We've had uh, I've actually had commit access uh, for their source tree for a while, um, and we have an approved cha approved pre-approved change to the Genie language um, to add support for protected uh, uh, methods and members versus just private. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
in Bala, we have yeah. public, protected, and private. Uh, private means nothing else can use this out of the class. Public means everything can access this. Uh, protected is a middle ground where the object and any subclasses of it can use it. Um, we don't have that right now in Genie. You have to choose public or completely private, which has been a problem before in Pysoy. The problem I have with protected is, honestly, how often do you get to use that? I mean, I've written Java for a good four years, and I think I've used it maybe ten times. Uh, Matt goes up. Uh-oh. And we have dead air. All right. Um, hoping Matt can hear this. Um, we're not getting a feed from you right now. Um, the cases we wanted to use protected and isolate were um, body subclasses, joint subclasses, things that we don't want anyone using, but we need to expose uh, as public. Um, things that were only useful to subclasses. So, not a high priority. Is he still here? Hmm. All right. Well, um, do we have anything else to do in this hangout? Um, there's this skybox. Okay. All right. I believe the broadcast is back. Um, we lost Matt. Um, he just went offline. So, uh... Just checking that the broadcast is actually working again. I'm assuming it is. All right, uh, Samuel, do you want to do your last bit? Uh, sure. Let's see. So we have a skybox here, and the camera is rotating around the point, so yeah. So what was the problem uh, with skybox before this? <clears throat> Currently it was uh, getting weird z-buffer errors, and it turned out uh, the Skybox wasn't being scaled with a matrix to keep it within Z near and Z far. Um, before it was one by one by one, and that go that goes within Z near. So, yeah. All right. So no matter how far away an object is, the skybox edge will still be shown on the as it, outside of that. Uh, it's using the old, it's using the old code, taking z far and dividing it by two, which should be within that range. Right. Yeah. I thought the z buffer was off previously, so that it would always be run at first. Uh, it's it still gets clipped within z near and z far, I think. Right. Oh, did we just push the render of the box and then render everything else on top of that? Uh, we rendered a box first with... Uh, actually, uh, I think it was changed with... The render. Uh, the def test is still enabled, but the skybox doesn't contribute to the def buffer. Got it. May or may not need to be changed, I'm not sure. Well, we can do some testing later and fix if it needs to. It's pretty cool, though, if we have the skybox back. Yeah. 
Do you know if the room walls are working yet? Uh, I think they are. Uh, let me... Should I code up a quick example, or...? Sure. Oh, okay. No, we have a few examples. Uh, hmm. Uh, do we have a example of, uh, I think, uh, okay, two cubes. Okay, here's uh walls. Yes, screen share. Oh, right. Just share it with the entire desktop. Uh so Okay, so it is working. Yeah. Um, is the is the light contributing to the skybox right now? I f wait. It shouldn't. I don't think they do. Hmm. Okay, this the skybox should be emissive, not um, not uh, uh, diffractive. Diffuse, diffusive. I think room has its own shader set, which does this. Okay. I'm not sure though. Okay. I, I I looked at the code. I don't remember uh, what was what. I do remember room should have been lit because the walls are supposed to be within the the scene, but the sky box is supposed to be so far away that light shouldn't be bouncing off of it. It should just be what it is. Oh yeah, uh, Skybox also has its own shader set, and it's just a simple diffuse color texture thing. Okay. Cool. Uh, anything else? I don't think so. Alright. Uh, hoping this one, this uh, hangout comes through okay on YouTube. Um, just a few days until Christmas. Uh, the great thing is that Every year, Google Code in, and we're hoping it's true again this year. Uh, as soon as everyone gets out on Christmas break, uh, Google Code in goes crazy. Um, I believe last year we got about half the students uh, through the entire program joined during this week. So we have some new tasks going up, uh, and I expect next week's Hangout is going to be pretty busy. Um, okay. So uh, hope you guys enjoy watching this. See you next week.